Kelsey and some of the basics of composition and using your camera. So right there was maybe a snapshot moment when you're taking a picture. This can help you with snapshots or actually photography like some of the stuff you see over here in the 4-H building. The two parts of photography I had mentioned were composition, which is setting up the things in your frame, and the second part would be learning how to better use your camera and the settings on it. So composition, you may ask, what is that? Well, it's the way in which the different parts of your photo are arranged, and these uh, photographers go off some basic rules of composition, but then also, even though they say basic rules, they're more like guidelines and not rules. So one of the first rules is simplicity, and here's an example of a photo that's very simple. You can tell what your subject is right away. Your eye is led to it. And the background isn't complicating or leading your eye away from the subject. Um, the, one of the basic rules, and you'll probably hear about this a lot, it's one of the more common ones, is the horizon line and the rule of thirds. These are very prominent in the photography and also art world. First is the horizon line rule. You have two horizon lines in the top and the bottom, which kind of divides your picture into three parts. So when you take a picture with a horizon line, which is where your land meets the sky, you don't normally want it smack dab in the middle. You want to put it either on the bottom or the top, leaving more room for what's more interesting in the picture or your subject. And the next would be rule of thirds, which is using your two horizon lines and then having two vertical lines like this graph here. And then you have four intersecting points of those lines. When you take a picture, you want your subject to lie in the area of these intersections, which will make it more interesting. And then also, wherever you place your subject, you want to give more room for the subject or what the subject is doing. So here's the fo uh, photo by Art Bull that I used. And you can see the seal right here is your subject, the silhouette. And it's shown in the intersection right here of the two lines. This is another example of it with the horizon line up top leaving more room for what's more interesting which would be the land. And then in the bottom left corner of the intersection are the two girls which are another part of the subject. As I had kind of covered a little bit earlier was having your entire subject shown and giving more room for it. So your subject, as I mentioned, is not only the person or the object, it's also what it's doing. So here you have a man who's writing, so you're giving more room for him and what he is doing. And then another example here is a lady is putting water in a bucket, so not only is she the subject, but what she's doing, her action is the subject. And you always want to leave more room for that in the picture. Another thing is point of view. There are three different points of views when taking pictures. Um, mostly they pertain to children and dogs or animals is when you would use these points of view, sometimes with uh, large things too. Uh, this would be an example of bug's eye point of view, making things seem very large. And then there's the normal point of view, which would be human eye level. And the next would be bird's eye, which would be making things appear small. And this is an example of whenever you're taking pictures of kids and dogs or pets, you want to get down on their level or make it a bug's eye level. And it makes it appear more interesting because you know what they're doing. Here there's no guess and you can see, you're almost as if you're looking at the child through their eyes and you can see what they're doing. In photos, there are different kinds of lines that convey actions or feeling within a person. Uh, here's an example of an S-curve line. S-curve promotes grace, and it makes a photo seem very graceful, and it can also lead your eye into the picture and into the different layers of it. Other lines are your horizontal line makes you feel tired because it's like this, as if you're laying down. A vertical line can make you feel very rigid and kind of stressed because it's straight up and down. And then the diagonal line gives a feeling of falling, which makes you very worried. And pictures
features, there are three different layers. You have your foreground. This example here, the foreground is the river, and that's what lies in front of your subject. You have your middle ground, which is usually includes your subject, which would be right here with the trees in the middle. And then you have your background, which would be behind your subject, which would be, for example, the mountains and the sky also. Most of the times, pictures just have the middle ground or the subject and a background. Every once in a while, you have foreground, sometimes not. And the more uh, depth you have, the more layers in your photo, the more, I would call it 3D, it will appear and the more realistic it looks. Another thing you want to look for is natural frames. If you are at a beach, for example here, I was at a beach, and then you see a natural frame of tree branches above you, you can use that to frame your photo, so then it's already drawing your eye right into the subject and you know what you are going to look at in the photograph. Simple background. This usually pertains to portraiture, which is taking pictures of people, normally senior pictures. These would be my cousin's senior pictures that I took. When you go to take pictures of people, sometimes you'll see a railroad going through someone's head or a fern sticking out of their ears. You want to try and avoid that because they can turn out rather silly but also very distracting. So here, when you, I was taking a picture of my cousin and I decided to put her with a simple background of just grass. And it has texture, so it gives the photo a little something more, but it's also very simple and it doesn't take your eye away from her and you know what you're looking at. One other rule is balance. And I like to use this as if you were to put your picture on one of the old time balancers that go like this, you don't want it to fall to one side or the other, you kind of want it to stay even. So here, even though the subject is on the left side of the photo, there's also some texture and rocks on the other side, which makes sure it doesn't just fall to one side. It'll kind of stay balanced in the middle, even though the subject and most of the, the eye is led to the left side. So this is the last rule, and I kind of made this one up myself, but I think it pertains to everything. And that is to be creative and original because even if you follow all those rules to a T, your photo might not be that interesting or you might not even like it. So I would just, my advice is to be creative and original when you're taking your pictures. Take things of what you like and you don't have to always follow the rules. For example, this picture has some rules in it with the rule of thirds but also it doesn't have all the rules. And then the next photo, oh, I took it out. Oh no. <laughs> well, this one doesn't have anything and I have some pictures where it's just abstract photography and that really doesn't follow any rules. Usually abstract doesn't. So here's some basics of how to take pictures on your camera. So some tips to use with your camera. Uh, first off, there's two different types of cameras. There's the point and shoot, which would be like this. It's just a point and shoot camera. You can't take off the lens and you don't usually have manual settings on them. The next would be you have SLR cameras, which have detachable lenses, lenses and SLR stands for single lens reflex. So you can take off the lenses and change them and you usually have more manual settings for aperture, shutter speed, exposure compensation, and the following. Uh, this will mainly cover point and shoot cameras. Uh, if you have a viewfinder on your point and shoot, which is becoming less common, try to use those because it shows what will be included in your frame better than the screen. And you usually tend to get a glare on your screen when you're in sunlight. The shutter is what you push to take the picture, and be gentle with your shutter. Squeeze it, don't push it down like this all the time, because then your photo will tend to be blurry because you're moving around, or it might be crooked. Flash versus natural light. Cameras usually have a pop-up flash. This one has a pop-up flash. 
and flash creates red eye in humans because of the way that the, the light bounces off inside the eye. And natural light tends to be better as a fill light because flash will just blow everything out and you'll get shadows in the background. So natural light is usually the best. Try to use natural light more than the flash if you can. Autofocus is almost always in the center. Sometimes now they have cameras that automatically identify what should be in focus. But what you want to do, especially with the roll of thirds, is if you take your camera, you can place your subject, what you want to be in focus, in the center, that's where your autofocus is at. And then after you do that, if you hold your shutter, the button you take, push to take the picture, you hold it halfway down, it, it does what it calls it, it locks the focus. So it will keep that object in focus. And then you move the camera, and you can move it to one of those spots that you want it to be in. So then you can keep your subject in focus while having it in the rule of thirds, and it's not dead center in the middle. Post cropping is also, if you maybe aren't sure how to adjust that picture, you can take the picture multiple ways, or you can take it in the center and leave enough room around the subject to crop it afterwards into the rule of thirds. Another tip now with digital photography, it's so easy to take multiple shots of something. If you're not sure how you want it to be, horizontal or vertical, or the different exposure you want to use it at, you can take multiple shots of it and figure out which one you like better later. And it's easier to compare side by side. I would recommend using different settings on the camera, and I won't go over them now because there are a million, honestly a million different settings now on cameras. They're usually on a little dial or they'll have a scene dial and then you can just turn it to that and especially with Canon I know there are many different settings that you can do. Uh, the next thing is zoom. There's digital zoom and optical zoom. This camera here, it has 14 times optical zoom which means the lens is actually doing the zooming. When you have digital zoom, that's when you start to get your pictures kind of grainy or pixelated. Pixels are what make up your photos, and when you're using digital zoom, it will turn out really fuzzy because of that. So try not to go past your digital zoom on your camera and maybe try and do that later because it will turn out blurrier if you use the digital zoom. And when you're taking a photo, I covered this earlier with the gentle with your shutter, but try and be steady, especially if you're in darker scene settings. Then if you're keeping your camera steady while you're taking the picture, you'll, your pictures will turn out sharper and not as blurry. Another tip I like to tell people, especially if it's dark, you can go like this and just set your elbows on something, which will keep it a little bit steadier than some than just going like this and maybe knocking it all over the place. You can brace yourself on something. Here's some manual settings. Sometimes these aren't always on point and shoots, but these are what are typically included, and especially now there's more and more of them on your point and shoot cameras. First would be your white balance. They have them for different types of light, like fluorescent, tungsten, cloudy, uh, bright sunlight, maybe snow, and even underwater, you have a different white balance setting. And that's just kind of the camera taking the light into effect and changing the colors the way that they look. Sometimes if you take a picture in tungsten or fluorescent light, you notice it looks maybe a little more blue or a little yellow. So try and adjust those. Usually just put it on auto if you're kind of taking snapshots. ISO is the next thing. This kind of depends on your subject and how fast it's moving or also how dark your lighting is. You want to use a slow one if you want. If your subject is in a very bright lighted area and isn't moving around as much, if you have a slow ISO, there will be less noise in the picture and noise is also graininess, which would be little dots in the picture you'll notice later when you blow it up. And then you can set it to medium if your light is kind of bright, but your subject's moving around a little. This will be like 100 to 400, and then you'll have some noise, but not necessarily as notable. And when you use a fast ISO, 
you will notice really bad noise. There will be a lot of little dots in it. And that you would try and use fast if it's a dark situation and your subject's moving really, really fast, maybe. Shutter speed is the next thing. Sometimes you can do it on your small point shoot cameras, but this is mainly for SLRs. The shutter is within the lens, and that is what opens and shuts to let the light in because the photograph is actually capturing the light of the situation. So the shutter speed goes one over and then a number. So for example, one over 40, and that would show how long, for instance, my hand is the shutter. It would open like this and then shut again. So it's controlling how much light is let into the picture. So if you have a very low lighting situation, you want your shutter to be open for as long as it can. And if you have a bright situation, you want your shutter to go really fast. So you're not getting the picture to be blown out, as you would call it, or very, very white. The aperture also includes the shutter speed. The aperture would be how large the opening is. So this would be a very large aperture, and this would be a small aperture. And the aperture you would have a large number if you want all of the things in your frame to be in focus. If you wanted your foreground, your subject, and your background to all be in focus, or if you wanted just your subject to be in focus, you would choose a small aperture. And when you're changing your aperture, you also have to change your shutter speed because then it's also changing how much light is let into your picture. And the next would be exposure or compensation. This is sometimes your best friend, especially when you want to shoot uh, something in a very low light situation or it's very bright and you want something exposed for a longer amount of time. You can set it up to the higher exposure compensation if you want the photo to appear brighter, but the shutter is not open for that long, and you can set it lower if your shutter is open for a long time and you want it to appear darker. So I hope you that you have learned many things about your cameras and you can go out and take maybe better snapshots or start working towards more photography and using cameras, and hopefully you can use your point and shoot better my uh, one suggestion is just to take out your booklet for your camera and flip through it a little bit to learn more about it. And also take it out and kind of take some pictures around and play with all the settings on it because that's honestly the best way to learn about it because all the cameras are so different now. But other than that, just keep in mind the rules or guidelines of compensation and then also how to better use your camera. So, are there any questions? Yes? What kind of camera do you prefer to use? The question was, what kind of camera do I prefer to use? Um, just, do you mean like SLR or what brand? Either and. Okay, I just recently got a Canon. I'm a Canon person because once you learn how to use one, it's easier to stick within that brand because all their settings are the same. I've tried to use Nikon, but I don't really mix well because they use different terminology and different buttons. So yes, I use Canon more often, and I like to turn people to Canon if they ask me what camera to buy, <laughs> but that's just me. And I prefer to use my SLR, single lens reflex. I have a Canon EOS 60D, if you know that terminology. It's an SLR, and I just got it for my graduation present. So it's very nice, and I prefer using that because it has more manual settings on it, and I can really kind of make the picture what I want it to be then. I don't have to leave it up to the auto of the camera. Yes? This might be a personal question, but can you give us a range of prices for cameras? Like starting at a very basic um, digital camera, like what you have, uh, just you know, okay. shoot camera, all the way up to like some of the cameras that you know, not necessarily you, but some okay. of them, you know, because I really don't know. Yes. Okay, so the question was about the price range of camera. Um, this camera is actually, this is a higher end point and shoot because it has the large optical zoom and this actually has manual settings on it. This cost me, I'm thinking around $400. We have gotten um, better point and shoots, higher end point and shoots for $200. 
I would say you could probably get point and shoots just basic for 150 depending on I recommend buying the better ones because they do last longer and that will you'll get your money's worth out of them because they're lasting longer and taking better photos. Um, and then the thing with the SLRs, it's not necessarily the body of the camera that takes the better picture, it's the lens. And that's where the big money comes in because you can have an awesome body of a camera but your lens might not be the best. So it's really, it depends on what you want to buy. Um, I'm trying to think. In the thousands, like 4,000, that's very high, but that's what you can get body for a camera for, depending on, they have like the starter kits, but then you, the lenses are what really cost them money. If that, does that make sense? Well, and I would imagine it depends on what your use is. Yeah. You know, if you're a professional photographer or if you're, you know, taking senior pictures or, you know, if you're being paid for your photos, you know, and not maybe just for fun. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, you, then your price might go down depending on what your use is. Is that true? Yeah, the prices, it, it, it really depends because you have portraiture lenses, lenses sorry, that they don't zoom and those would be used for senior pictures or so. That's when you don't need to zoom in. You're just in a small range. And then there's also telephotos. That's what you commonly see when you watch sporting events. They have the yes. huge lenses yes. like this, big around. So those would be... Those are also expensive, but the portraiture, you can get a little lens like that and it will cost a thousand dollars. It really, it really depends. And it's, it's hard to say just a general price range because it costs so much for different things. Are there any other questions? Well, that concludes my presentation. Thank you.